Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the launch of The Promise by Damon Golgott. My name is Jennifer Malik. I'm the ed editor of The Reading List, and we're hosting this launch tonight along with Penguin Random House South Africa and Umuzi. Joining Damon for the discussion this evening is Mark Kapitzer. Mark is one of South Africa's foremost writers. His most recent book, The Pink Lion, Journeys Across the World's Queer Frontiers, was recently long listed for the 2021 Sunday Time CNA Literary Awards and was named one of the 100 must-read books of 2020 by Time magazine. Mark writes frequently for The Guardian, The New York Times, Granta, and many other publications. He lives in Cape Town. Damon Golgott is a novelist who has twice been shortlisted for the Booker Prize for The Good Doctor and In a Strange Room. His novel Arctic Summer was nominated for the Walter Scott and Folio Prizes, and his fiction has been published in 16 languages. A film adaptation of his novel, The Quarry, starring Michael Shannon, was released in 2020. He lives and works in Cape Town as well. The Promise, the novel we're celebrating this evening, which I have here, um, charts the crash and burn of a white South African family living on a farm outside Pretoria. In this story of a diminished family, sharp and tender emotional truths hit home. Confident, deft, and quietly powerful, The Promise is literary fiction at its, at its finest. The book has received some uh, jaw-dropping amount of praise from some of the biggest names in literature. And um, if, you go to the reading, if you go to readinglist.click, our website, and search for The Promise, you'll see a story I put up a couple of weeks ago charting those um, blurbs that, that Damon has received from, honestly, some, <laughs> some big names. So <laughs> it, was quite, um, <laughs> it was quite astonishing. Well, I shouldn't say that though. It's kind of you know, it's it's deserved and expected. But I mean, it's just the list of people saying it's the best book they've ever read. Read, read is is quite something. Um, the American novelist Edmund White called it the most important book of the last ten years. Um, so yes, yeah, if you haven't got a copy for yourself yet, this is what it looks like. Go to your nearest bookstore tomorrow, good or bad, and it'll be on the shelves. And you can also order it online, obviously, if you're being careful on um, any of the. Um, the sites that sell books, you should be able to get a copy. Um, please leave your questions about the book in the comment section, wherever you're watching this video, on Facebook or on YouTube, and we'll have time to answer some of those questions during a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so um, I'm sure Damon will be glad to answer any questions you have about the book, about writing, about um, how you write, um, you know, during a pandemic, or <laughs> any of the, the pressing questions you have. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let me hand over to Mark and um, enjoy the discussion. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and welcome, Damon. Thanks, and Mark, and thanks, Jennifer, too. It's it's uh, wonderful being here talking to you about this book, which is, um, quite frankly, one of the most thrilling literary experiences I've had in, in a very long time. Um, I've read it twice, once in draft, and and once between covers, between these, these very handsome covers. And um, it is quite remarkable in, in the way um, it, it hits on truths and on, on political truths, on emotional truths, uh, while also through, through, not while also, but through a, a kind of experimental, innovative style that um, has deep, deep roots in in modernist literature, but at the same time is 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 all of Damon's own and all of this moment's own. And I think that's one of the, the triumphs of this book is is its um is its genealogy and its uniqueness. So congratulations, Damon. Uh, it's 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 really wonderful to be with you. Um, I'm going to begin with a a quotation a a a, a, a citation by Claire Massoud from her review in Harper's Magazine. She wrote, to praise this novel in its particulars, for its seriousness, for its balance of formal freedom and elegance, for its humor, its precision, its human truth, seems inadequate and powerful. Simply, you must read it. Like other remarkable novels, it is uniquely itself and greater than the sum of its parts. So I thought let's let's begin, Damon, by by talking about those parts and and sort of adding them up, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about about the structure of the book, um, 
what it concerns and, and how you came to the structure? Um, as I'm sure you know, Mark, I mean, books arrive in unexpected ways. I mean, we're always, as writers, looking for the next project, what might be interesting enough to occupy us for a few years. Um, and I'm no different in that respect. Um, the kind of germ of the book, the very first germ of the book came through a conversation with a friend who is a bit older than me um, and who is, as it happens, the last surviving member of his family. He's lost his mother, his father, his brother and his sister. Um, and he is a very funny raconteur and he had me in stitches one day with a series of anecdotes about sort of family incidents at the hall funerals family funerals that he's been to. Um, so, you know, funerals are very sad events, obviously, but they tend to involve the living more than the dead. Um, and it occurred to me that it might be an interesting structure for a, for a book or, or, or a way of looking at a family's history if, if you could do it through the device of all family funerals. If, you, if all you were telling was what happened at this particular time when this body was being buried. And you saw the same cast of characters, you know, at the next funeral and at the next one and the next one. But you would never tell characters as they die. Um, well, some people die, but there, there are always more um, <laughs> stepping in. But, you know, this is a history of the living, not, not the dead. So um, I thought it would be an interesting way to tell a family's history, basically. Um, and starting with that as a framework, uh, I sort of went sideways and thought, well, you could, you could do more than just tell the family history. You could, if you space those funerals out um, in different decades of South African history, you could sort of open the window a little bit wider and show some of the background of where South Africa was at that point. So the structure of the book is basically four snapshots in each of which a member of the same family has been put into the ground, but you're seeing more or less the same cast of characters, a little bit older, maybe not wiser, but different. Um, so yeah, that, that is how I sort of arrived at the structure of it. I'm, you know, like other writers, always looking for unusual ways to tell stories because most of the stories have been told by now. It's just the ways of telling that, you know, mm. are new. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so, so the, so the Moments, uh, first is in, in 1986 during the state of emergency. Um, and then, then that, and that is when the, the, the almost saintly mother of this family, Rachel Swart, dies of cancer. And uh, her 13 year old daughter, Amor, is pulled out of a boarding school to go home to deal with the death of her mother and with her family. Um, and then in, in subsequent chapters, as we transition uh, from the 1980s into The Promise, uh, the book is called The Promise, into the promise of the post-apartheid future, um, various other members of, fa of the family expire in, in quite horrific ways. And we, um, and we, we, we follow the family uh, with, with precisely that mordant humor that, that you heard from the raconteur who was telling you about his family as, as they bury their loved ones and, and various other things happen along the way. Um, you, I'd, I'd like you to read, if you would, Damon, a section from that first chapter, uh, which is called Ma, uh, after Amor, the 13-year-old, has returned home and the family has united in grief uh, over the death of the matriarch. Um, I'd better sort of just give a little bit of context to this reading. It, it, it comes from fairly early on, um, and it, it's, it's focused on the family sleeping when we start. So we're, we're visiting, as it were, each member of the family, and we're getting a little bit of an insight into the dreams that are taking place. Um, there'll probably be space to say more about the passage and how it works afterwards. It is night, the same night, but later, the stars have moved on. 
Only a cuticle of moon casting the faintest metallic glow onto this landscape of rocks and hills, making it look almost liquid, a mercurial sea. The line of the main road is stitched out now and then in slow motion by the headlamps of a car, carrying its cargo of human lives going from somewhere to somewhere. The house is dark, except for floodlights fore and aft. Note the nautical terms, illuminating the driveway and the lawn and a single lamp left on inside in the lounge. In the various rooms downstairs, everything is mostly inert, except for the occasional scuttling insect or is it a rodent? And the tiny expansions and contractions of the furniture pitter, patter, creak, crack. But upstairs in the bedroom, there's a flickering going on. Paul's mattress is a raft, tossing on a current of uneasy dreams. He has taken a sedative prescribed by Dr. Raft, and it keeps his head just under the surface, looking at images refracted from above. His wife is in many of them, but altered somehow, a bit squirt. A trace in her of another person altogether, someone he doesn't know. How can this be, he cries to her, you're dead. That's an unforgivable thing to say, Marnie, she tells him. I'm very hurt. His heart is wrung like an old rag. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Through the wall beside him, just an outstretched arm away, Astrid ripples in her sleep. She has recently lost her virginity to a boy she met at the ice rink, and sex flows through her like a golden wind. She has forgotten the pain, though it's part of a shimmer around the faces of young men with their bristly beards, and in this dream around the face of Dean DeVette in particular, whose mouth is a pink color it doesn't have in waking life, thrilling her deep inside, down where everything meets. In the guest bedroom, Sunny Marina dozes and starts Dozes and stars. She achieves only the beginning of a dream in which she's on a picnic with P.W. Puerta at an old fort somewhere, and he's feeding her strawberries with thick white fingers before she gets woken by a kick. At home in Menlo Park, she doesn't share a bed with Oki, who lies twitching beside her like a hit and run victim waiting for medical assistance. What a thought, Marina, sis on you, but you can't help what you think, it's only human. And far worse has gone through your mind. Oh, yes, it has. Her husband's foot touches her. She pulls her foot away. Terrible to flinch from what you once briefly loved or thought you did or wanted to think you did, but are shackled to regardless for life. At the other end of the chain, Oki jerks like a dancing bear. He doesn't dream, not exactly, unless the shadows he splashes through are a sort of dream, but nothing quite happens. There's just a question of color changing all the time. A bubble rises from the seabed, becomes a breaking of wind against the flank of his wife, who stiffens and flares her nostrils in protest. And in her bedroom at the end of the passage, a more lies sleepless, hour after hour. Not unusual for her, believe me, every night before she drifts off, her mind must move outward from where her body is based on its back in bed to reach out and touch certain objects in particular places in a specific order. Only when she's done that can she relax enough to let go. But tonight it doesn't work. Other images from the day are too powerful. They come jostling in, Miss Starkey's pressed together lips, Lucas's stick hitting the ground, the sore place on her arm where her aunt pinched her, so much rage in her fingers, sending out a little pulse of pain into the universe. Notice me, I'm here, a more swap, 1986. May tomorrow never come. Who's to say? Perhaps all these dreams might merge together, making a single, larger dream, a dream by the whole family, but somebody is missing. At this very instant, he's stepping out of a buffle in a military camp south of Johannesburg, wearing army browns and carrying a rifle. He used the rifle yesterday morning to shoot and kill a woman in Katla Hall, an act he never imagined committing in his life. And his mind has done little since, except turn that moment over and over in wonderment and despair. Swat, Yaakovlo, the chaplain wants to see you. The chaplain, he's never spoken to the chaplain.
It can only be, he thinks, that the man knows what he did and wants to talk to him about it. His sin has somehow transmitted itself. He has taken a life. He must pay. But I didn't mean to. But you did. She was throwing a stone. She bent down to pick it up. A flash of rage passed through him, concomitant with her. He didn't think. He hated her. He wiped her away. All in a few seconds, an instant, over and done. Never over. Never done. Hmm. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Damon. As I, as I listened to you read, I was reminded that your background is in the theater. As, as a writer and as a director and even as a performer. And, and in a way that might give us a clue uh, to my next question, uh, which is, who is this narrator who is floating over sleeping bodies and then uh, is, in a, is in a military campground watching the one member of the family who isn't there, who, who tells us to note the nautical terms that it's using and who, um, who says it's not unusual for a more, believe me, um, and who, who is able to be in, very much inside these characters, but can also kind of pull them all together and make sort of broad sweeping statements about um, the merging of these dreams into one unity. Yeah, um, well, I'm the narrator, of course, but, you know, every, every third person, every book written in the third person has a, has a sort of, by tradition, third person omniscient voice narrating its story. I've sort of been quite, um, I don't know what the word is, but I've been wanting to write a third person narrative for quite a while. Um, and have been frustrated by the conventions of the genre, if you like. Um, in the end, a third-person narration is not much different to a first-person narration, in the sense that you're limited, um, usually, by the conventions that apply. So even, a, even an omniscient narrator is meant to tell you a story that's grounded in scenes that are well established, in which the reader gets the sense of, okay, this is your main character, this might be your antagonist, this is the background of the situation we're in, and so on. Um, all of which has a kind of creaky way of, you know, wheeling the machinery into place and, and, and setting the plot in motion. I did begin this um, in a more conventional way. I, I, I started writing the story as I conceived it um, and became quickly quite frustrated with myself and with it uh, and with the limitations that it posed. And then fortuitously or otherwise, I got sidetracked into writing a couple of drafts of a film script which was offered to me. I'm talking about a few years back. Uh, I needed the money, I needed the diversion, and I was, I was happy to be sidetracked for, what, eight months or so. And, you know, the film script was good in certain respects, but in one very key respect, it transformed my book for me, because when I returned to the novel, you know, um, the sort of mode of narration that film scripts require was still very much in my brain. And I suddenly saw that all my frustrations um, with this third person narration could be subverted if I just extended the range of the voice a little bit. In other words, what I, what I saw was that it was possible to work with prose in the same way that a film works. Um, that I could tell the story uh, with the logic of a cinematic narrative. I could zoom in up close on a particular moment I could pull back really, really far and give it a kind of um, historical epic dimension. I could, I could um, jump from character to character, even in the middle of a scene, because cameras work like that. Um, and basically, this realization was sort of scary because I didn't know if it would work, but it was also quite liberating because it gave me the means to sort of play narratively. So that's what I did. 
Um, and part of the play, which you've put your finger on, is that it opened up the space in the narrative voice where I could comment on the fact that I was narrating something. So this is a narrator who's telling you what happens, he's telling you that this follows on, this is the next event and so on. But at the same time, the narrator knows that he or she is telling a story and, and, and is aware of the way in which he or she is telling the story and can that, comment on that. that, that theatrical convention, the cinematic convention, to have a narrator um, who is also sort of quirky or idiosyncratic, unreliable in some ways. Um, and, and, and in that way, may or may not be you, Damon, the writer. And certain things that the narrator also can't see or, or chooses not to see or sees and chooses not to tell us, like the, the evil thoughts inside of a priest or the or the dirty thoughts inside of a doctor um, that that the narrator says, we're not going to go there, if you don't mind, or, 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 or very memorably and, and very significantly, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a central character, a domestic worker named Salome, who the narrator makes very clear is impossible to enter, cannot, cannot, cannot be seen in the way the other characters see, and that has that has a narrative and political impact. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's quite a short comment on your part, incidentally, that, 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 that that's the theatrical convention. I, I sort of think that theater and cinema in some ways is, you know, ahead of um, novels um, because, you know, they, they play with narrative in ways that maybe the novel is not old enough to do a lot of the time, but there's, there's no reason why it shouldn't. Um, well, I'm I, as, sorry, I'm, I, 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 I'd like to follow through on, on what you said, because I'm, I'm as fascinated with the edge of the map where narration is concerned as I am with what, what narration covers. So there's, there's in, the, in the same way that if, if you're working with cinema, you know, the, the camera moves like that, but there's a whole bunch of things outside what the camera's seeing. I mean, a, a character on screen can be talking to somebody off screen, and, and, and it's sort of required of the audience that they imagine that of the other character and, and, and what's happening, for example. So I'm quite fascinated narratively with what's not said. Um, in, in, in the case of this book, we're, we're only opening the window, you know, in four different decades, but we're not being filled in um, with what might have happened to the, the characters that we're picking up on in the intervening time. So for me, that's quite enjoyable. You, you see a character who's 10 years older and whose life's in a different place, but it's not being explained to you what's taken place or where that person might have gone or what might have befallen them. You just see that their life is different, which actually is how a lot of human life works, right? You meet someone you haven't seen in years and years, and you don't know everything that's happened to them, but you can see that they've aged or they've changed and so on. So all of that sort of off screen or off stage, as it were. So I quite like that. Where, yeah. where, where, the, where you, you, you picked up on the fact that um, we have a central black character whose life is not explained, whose experiences are not narrated. Now, obviously, that's a deliberate choice on my part. I mean, I could have gone there, but in in terms of the subject matter of this book, I decided early on this is a book about white South Africans. It's about the white South African psyche, if there is an entity like that. Um, and I thought I would look at the black characters that turn up in the story only as far as the white gaze of this narration would go, which is to say not very far at all. Um, so there was a certain amount of fun, painful fun, but fun nevertheless, in, in giving you a, you know, a little bit of knowledge about these black characters that's popping right there because I know the white characters in this house would not have inquired any further than that. So that's as much as I'm telling my audience as well. Um, which in a way, you know, by not telling you something, tells you something about how right. people think. Yeah. I, I want to come back to that a little bit later, but, but before we do, I, I want to comment on, on your comment that, that, that film and that cinema and theater are perhaps ahead of fiction, of, of prose fiction. 
when it comes to exploring all of this. At some point in your writing, um, knowing where my heart lies literarily, uh, you said you wanted to read some Virginia Woolf. And you did. I think you read, was it Mrs. Dalloway or, or, or To the Lighthouse? Well, I read, I read everything, yeah. yeah. What, she, why? She's a recent discovery for me. Why? why? Why did you want to read her while thinking about writing The Promise? Hmm. I, I sort of discovered Virginia Woolf at the right time. I mean, I sort of stumbled on her early on in the writing process. But obviously, her achievement, um, working with multiple voices, polyphonic narratives, um, is very central to what I'm doing here. You know, she's celebrated as um, a great modernist for obvious reasons. Um, and the roots of this book lie in modernism. Um, they lie pretty much with the modernists that I dealt with earlier in my life, or not, not dealt with, but that I encountered. I mean, very fundamental to me in my reading history was William Faulkner, um, an Australian writer called Patrick White, um, you know, Samuel Beckett. Most of the people who celebrated um, as, you know, the great modernist writers were the, were the writers that spoke most loudly and clearly to me when my kind of writing consciousness was being shaped. Virginia Woolf wasn't part of that for whatever reason. Um, she's an omission in my reading until relatively recently. Um, and it was a great pleasure, incidentally, to share some of my newfound enthusiasm about Virginia Woolf with you, because I know she's an old discovery of yours. But very clearly, with books like The Waves or To the Lighthouse, Virginia Woolf is playing with time, she's playing with voice uh, in ways that you know are very resonant with this particular project. Not mm -hmm. that I was trying to imitate her, but you know, it, it helps to feed the general enthusiasm if you're reading people who are pretty much playing in the same way you're playing, um, which I'm sure you, you know all about. So, so the, the, the critical writing about the novel so far has, has spoken of its um, proximity to Wolf, to Joyce, to Faulkner, so to the kind of high practitioners of modernism I would put Beckett in there as well. I think there's a there's there's some you know fantastic Beckettian dialogue, um, uh, surrealist Beckettian dialogue in in this novel. There's something that the critic James Wolfe wrote. James, sorry, excuse me, James Wood wrote in his New Yorker review that I urge everybody to read. After comparing you very very favorably to Wolfe's approach. Um, he wrote, modernist writing like Wolf's sometimes appears to have expired along with its serious and experimental epoch, a moment when political and moral disenchantment was met by a belief in literature's regenerative power. And I think he's right about the, um, the modernist lit writing having expired. It was, it was very much of, of, of the early to mid 20th century. Um, uh, he's also right that, in, that aesthetically, a, a ser we no longer live in a serious and experimental epoch. It, that then was a moment of political and moral disenchantment that those writers met, tried to meet with their belief in literature's regenerative power. Your novel charts uh, 30 years of deep political and moral disenchantment. And I wonder if that's why uh, you felt the need to reach back to these forms of modernism, to, to, to the way Wolf occupies all sorts of subjectivities, uh, to the absurdism of Beckett, uh, to the elusive more than humor of Joyce as a way of dealing with this disenchantment. And, and, and I'm asking you this within the context of of the way your 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 story tracks these years very directly in in our, in the, the breaking or or falling apart of the South African promise. I mean, it's a fair question, but um, you know, I'd be I'd feel slightly fraudulent if I if I said to you I I embarked on the writing with those intentions, you know, very 
fully formed and clear in my head, that wasn't the case. As I'm sure you know, books accumulate. You know, mm. you get an idea, you get a second idea, you start to play, and then something else falls onto that, and so on. So, the notion of um, looking at South Africa's recent history came to me quite late, to be honest. My, my, my embarkation point with this book um, was really to look at the family. I, I wanted to look at this group of people. I didn't really have a grand sense of staging that this might be, you know, um, looking at something larger. Um, that really came to me because I thought, all right, I've got four funerals, and then I thought, well, you could set the four funerals in a different decade of South African history, and that sort of opened up the possibility that, all right, there, there would be a different president in power, and there would be a different sort of reigning spirit over the land, and it might be fun, for want of a better word, to sort of conjure that spirit and, and to show it as part of the ethos uh, of this section of the book. Um, so the project really had quite modest aspirations in, in, in that respect. You know, I, I, I was playing with other things too, which maybe don't register so strongly. For example, um, you know, there's a, each, each funeral takes place in a different season. Um, it's not, it's not important whether the reader notices that or not, but, but it's important to me. Um, and I was somewhat surprised, to be honest, that so many readers have picked up on the political or historical dimension of the book because it wasn't that big in my, my own mind. I, I was seeing the characters and the personal aspect as much larger than the politics. It was meant to be, you know, wallpaper. But very clearly, that's not, not the way it's come across. Um, so in a way, I've sort of arrived at the end of the project at the viewpoint that James would articulate, which is that, yes, this is sort of a book rising to meet the historical moment. I, I, I had no such, you know, grandiose um, intention when I began. I'm very, very happy if I fulfilled that, but it, it was not part of my, um, you know, to, to be honest with you, not part of what I was aspiring to. I mean, I think it's... It was it was interesting to hear you use the word fun, uh, to say it might be fun. And, and I, don't want to, I don't want to diminish what fun might mean for a writer. Um, I don't want to make it seem sort of casual, like, you know, a night out on the town. Um, but it is just quite fascinating and even a little shocking to hear you use the word fun um, to describe the, the, the writing of, of what really is such pain and objection. And in a way, there's that, ba that balance is very powerful in the book. And, and in a way, what, what, when you speak about fun, I wonder if that isn't uh, your belief in literature's regenerative power when faced with the horror, the horror, as, as, as one of the characters Anton says, you know, quoting other people um, at, at what's happening to this family, to the country. Um, there does seem to be something, I mean, some of the critics found, have found the book very bleak, you know, even bleaker than J.M. could say is disgrace, and we can talk about the parallel in a minute, but what, what seems to me to be not, if not redemptive, then, then at least hopeful is, is, is the regenerative power of what fun means. Of fun as a as a way of, of as a creative as a creative instinct rather than yeah. instruction. I did have I want to say that I did have an enormous amount of fun writing, um, and, it's and I'm not sure that I could have completed the project if if that wasn't the case. And the fun is rooted absolutely in the voice, you know, which, as I've articulated, sort of came to me at a relatively late point when I realised that you could tell the story in unexpected ways. So although the story itself is heavy um, and the subject matter, aging and death, is heavy, I think the narrative voice is light. And it, it, it was inside the narrative voice that I had the fun I had, and, and I really did. I really did. Um, 
I think I would not have been able to carry on with such a death saturated book if I was not really inventing and feeling free to kind of play with the voice. So um, that narrative voice basically opened up a space in which I could um, comment on the characters, comment on what they were thinking and doing, but also comment on myself and the way that I was telling the story. And there was an enormous element of play in that. So, um, anything in that commentary on the self, that self-awareness, that, that, that ability to look at the self in, in which you see sort of creative or regenerative power? Because some, so many of these characters in this book, well, all of them but for one, really, the survivor, are totally blind to who they are in the world. And, and the one woman who survives, the one member of the family who doesn't die, is able to reflect. Yeah, I mean, you're doing a juggling act as a novelist, really, because you, you know, I, I work with students a fair bit, creative writing students. Um, and something I often tell them is that, you know, there's this idea that if you engage with your material and you have this kind of cathartic um, experience of, you know, yes, I identify, I relate, I have these passionate emotions, that you feel you've really done your job as a writer. And in fact, that's just the beginning of your job. You, you do need to engage with material. You need to feel it from the inside in order to be able to set it down in any shape or form. But you also need to be detached from it. You need to be outside that material, right? To be judging it and reading it as if somebody else wrote it. Because how are you going to improve it? How are you going to take it another step further if you can't be critical of your own work. So there's this sort of internal engagement and this attempt to be external, to pull back and look at it from outside, which I think is what messes with writers' heads most of the time. You, you, that's, you know, that's, you, that's fair enough um, and, and very interesting. Um, that's about the creative process um, as a writer. No, no, but could it... Could, yeah. could I go one step further, which may answer you? It's not, yeah. it's not just about the process if you if you try to build it into the material. Now, I've, I've tried to do that once before with an earlier book, In a Strange Room, okay, mm -hmm. in which the narrative switches between um, a first-person voice. The book is talking about somebody called Damon, who very clearly seems to be me. Um, and sometimes I'm talking out of that person, I'm speaking as an I, I did this, I said this, I, and at other times, sometimes in the same sentence, I switch to an external perspective and say, he did this, he thought this, he, he said that. So that's a kind of, um, that's a way of coding this process that I've been talking about, of being inside and outside at the same time. It's a way of coding it into the text itself. And I've, I've tried to do the same thing here. Okay, so at some point, this narrative is very clearly third person. He or she is going here and saying that. But then the voice, the, the narrative perspective gets so close to a character that it almost falls into that character's perspective. So, so when, you, when, I, when I was feeling as a narrator very, very close to a particular character, I would sometimes lapse into first person. So if I felt very, very closely identified with ma or pa or a brother or a sister, sometimes I would be inside their head and speaking out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Which is, you know, um, it's a convention of very, of, of what I think is called close third person narration, where you, you come so close that you, you sort of identify with the character. But I sort of try to build it in as part of the language of the book, part of the idiom of the way of telling the story, that it could be first person sometimes, and that it would be more detached and that you know, maybe even more detached from the conventional what I'm, reaching, what I'm reaching for is where it becomes a sort of ethical problem rather than, than just a style. Well, what do, you, what do you mean by ethical? That, that it becomes a sort of a, 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 an answer to how to live, particularly as a white South African uh, in this country at this time. Or, 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 or not, maybe not an answer, but a, but a, but a, a suggestion or a, or a solution 
of how to live as a white South African at this time? I have to say, I feel an instinctive shrinking away um, when, I, when I hear phrases like, you know, how to live. The role of the novelist at a certain point um, was seen as somebody who could deliver that kind of moral advice that, you know, the, the, the novelist was somebody who would tell you how to live, that the novelist knew that the novelist was wiser than the ordinary person. That's a role for a writer I've, I've always felt instinctively kind of, um, I don't know what the word is, but I, I, I just, I don't, I don't have that wisdom. I don't feel I do. I don't know how to live. I'd have it more than you, than you admit or know. Uh, in in and and I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, in a way, if if you if you knew it, you might be terribly self righteous and and therefore a very boring novelist. But it, it, but if I think about um, Amor, who's your central character, and who's the one character who doesn't die a horrible death, and um, the choices she makes, and and her power of reflection, but also. What, what what is lost in her to be able to make those choices how how she how she has to how she has to lose contact with other people to make those choices uh, there, there's something about that that terrible predicament that she's in that makes her um, to me to this reader something of a South African every person um, uh, it, engaged on a, on a moral journey um, and it's interesting that you do, you didn't you didn't schematize her in that way. I mean, thank God you didn't schematize her in that way. Uh, but there she is, the one person in the book who has some sense of 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 reflection of who she is in the world. I can only answer this question. Um, in terms of this particular book and how it worked for me. In other words, I, I don't see a more of the sole protagonist, to be honest. I, 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 for me, this book has two antagonists. That is Amor and her brother, her older brother, Anton. Mm -hmm. And in some way, at a point Anton, in the right... In the one who, who killed the woman in Katlehong. Uh, just the, the day before his mother's funeral, who we met in that yeah. opening which, session. Which is, oh, in certain respects, just a passing detail. I mean, it's, it's not, clearly, but in terms of the, you know, the, the area that the book covers, it's a passing detail belonging to that time. In terms of his life, and obviously of the life of the woman that he killed, that's not a passing detail. But in some way, I realized during the writing of the book, that Amor and Anton, brother and sister, who are facing off of this question of, you know, this crappy piece of land that has supposedly been left or should have been left to uh, the black woman who works for their family. The two of them in some way embody um, what, what I feel to be, uh, I'm sorry, these are in inadequate um, descriptions, but the two sides of my own nature and maybe mm. the two sides of, 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 of a kind of white South African nature, if you like. Mm. And Trump is far more, um, you know, selfish, concerned with his own interests, his future, his sense of self. And more his younger sister, who might or might not have something wrong with her, is far more self-denying, a little bit of a Simon Veil kind of figure, somebody uh, who believes you need to give stuff up for other people in order for all of us to live properly. Um, a little bit of a saint and a little bit inadequate as a result, but that um, the two of them in some way represent the two aspects of my own nature. So when I say I'm working off them in this book, I'm not trying to prescribe what white South Africans should be doing with their future. I don't think what Amor does, which is effectively to renounce her inheritance, I'm not prescribing that as a way forward for this country. I don't know that that's what white South Africans would be prepared to do or even whether it would help us out. All I know is that in terms of the particular dilemma that I set up with this narration, in other words, this piece of land and what ought to happen to it, that Amor represents one side of my instinct, 
which is give it up. Give up your inheritance. Give up what you own because it's the right thing to do. And what does Anton of, of your instincts? Well, you know, I also, I'm also a white South African. I'm a white male. You know, in the first section of the book, Anton sees his future as set up for him, right? He's this golden boy who's just by virtue of being white and male sort of stepped into the position of absolute power. Um, and if apartheid hadn't ended, his life would have been set up for him. Basically, he didn't need to do anything else. It would have been handed to him. And that's sort well, that of what you and I stepped into by virtue of birth. Everything's changed since then. And I, I wanted in some way to show what's changed. I mean, not only the future, but also the options that are open to you. You know, yeah. Anton can, can give up his birthright, but he won't because he thinks he should be holding on to it. He thinks he should hold on to what he has, which a great many South Africans feel. And I, I don't know whether they're right or wrong, but I, I, I identify with Amor, finally, more than with Anton, rightly or wrongly. The interesting thing about Anton is, is that he... I mean, he's such a fuck up. It's I mean, he's an interesting fuck up, but he's a fuck up. And and firstly, it's it's not it, it's not clear whether he's a fuck up because you know he killed a woman when he was on active duty in the township, and and then was a then became a conscientious objector, and then uh, the end of apartheid happened. Or whether he's a fuck up because he his father's a fuck up, and because he comes from this family with with all sorts of intergenerational traumas. Um, but but he doesn't he doesn't he's not being asked to give up his inheritance. He's being asked to give up just a portion of his inheritance. That's all, which is what Amor believes um, was promised to Salome, uh, the black maid. And he doesn't do it not because he doesn't want to do it, but just because he's kind of useless and can't make a decision. And and I thought there was something about that that. Um, that was a sort of white South Africanness, a kind of an inertia, um, a, a, an inaction that that that, that I felt um, quite awkwardly uh, a, a, about white South Africans of our generation. I, I wanted to say though that when you speak about these characters, these two antagonists, as being versions of of yourself, I immediately thought of the Good Doctor. And and of your two antagonists in the Good Doctor, Lawrence Waters, who's this, um, who's this, like a more, really wants to change the world and is and is is wants to give everything to making the new South Africa a better place. Not like a more in a, in a, in a more active way. And then and then the more kind of um, cynical narrator Frank, um, who has has seen it all. And who, like Anton, is a casualty of having done military service, and and is much more cynical and sardonic about everything. I wonder, I, I, of, of, of your previous works, um, this book resonates. The promise resonates most with the Good Doctor. I wonder if it does so for you too. Yeah, I mean, maybe for the reasons you've just raised, because I mean, I think that's an astute comment. Um, as I recall, I think I think I started writing The Good Doctor from the perspective of Lawrence, the more idealistic doctor, huh. and then realized that he wouldn't make a very interesting narrator. I mean, idealists don't make for interesting narrators generally. Um, I I do I do think um, they probably you know are more Anton Lawrence and Frank. They they do represent you know, kind of warring sides of the white South African psyche. I mean, certainly as, as they sort of live in me. I don't think I'm more as idealistic in the way that Lawrence was idealistic. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the kind of idealism has maybe gone. I more just think this promise was made, we should, we should fulfill the promise. And there's something sort of dogged and maybe a little bit simplistic about the way she just sticks to that. We made a promise, this promise must be kept. Um, I mean, for what it's worth, that is, wrong? as you say, well, there might be sort of neurological. Yeah, we know she was struck by lightning as a child, and, 
Yeah. Several other characters say they think there's something the matter with her. So yes, maybe there's something the matter with them, or maybe her, maybe her insistence on fulfilling this promise is just not realistic, and that therefore there's something wrong with her. Um, for what it's worth, I mean, I th this aspect of the book, um, the question of the land, comes comes from a, a different friend and a different sort of family anecdote that that somebody told me, um, which is quite sort of closely carried out in the book. Um, this, this friend of mine's mother had died a long time ago. She'd been very ill and she'd been tended through her last illness by a black woman who had been working for their family for years and years. And the whole family promised, as the mother wished, that this sort of really broken down house in which this black lady lived and the piece of land on which it's situated would be given to her. And yet the family hedged and sort of blocked and argued, despite the fact that they promised for decades and decades and decades until quite recently signing over this piece of land. Now, this struck me as a very South African story. I mean, obviously, you know, the question of land and who owns it is, is, is central to South Africa, but this is not a, an important piece of land. It's a, it's a useless piece of land, not, not one that you can work with. The house is not, you know, that desirable, and yet this family would not give it up. Now, that strikes me as quite South African, too. Now, whether, you know, whether Anton and the rest of the family just are, you know, victims of inertia, as you would have it, or whether they have more complicated reasons for not giving it up is sort of part of the, the book. To my mind, it's not just inertia on Anton's part, although it's harder to articulate. Why would you not give up this shitty little house and the, and the crap piece of land that it stands on? Because you own it. You already own it, why give it up? Now that seems very much part of how white South Africa operates to me. You know, it's, it's naive and simplistic, maybe to a level that matches a more, but I've often wondered how much different this country would be if, let's, let's leave color out of it. If people who are privileged enough to own a little money, a little land, a little something in the setup we have here, would just give up part of it to people who have nothing. Maybe our general situation would be very different and maybe a little bit better. So I guess that unspoken question is, is, is behind the book. That is, um, that's, that's, abs that's beautifully put. Um, it, um, it is really that which, which stay, it's, it, 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 it's, it's those ideas unformed in my mind that, that stayed with me when, when I finished the book, um, uh, Claire Massoud in her review in Harper's said, the promise evokes when you reach the final page, a profound interior shift that is all but physical. This as an experience of art happens only rarely and it is to be prized. And I mean, I think those words are true. I've been thinking about what that profound interior shift is, what it is that feels so shifted uh, by having finished this book. And maybe that's it. it, it, it it's being faced with, with a thought of how our world might be different if, if those of us who had something uh, were willing to give it up. And, and 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 I suppose even even if you, you didn't set out to write a moral fable, and as I say, thank God you didn't. The fact that that's what one leaves with uh, puts the book, the novel, in 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 in, in that realm, uh, and does also make me think of Quitsier's disgrace. Um, now James Wood directly. Uh, connects your book to disgrace. And in disgrace, you also have um, a, a white woman who, who decides to stay on the land and give birth to the child of her rapist, even after she's been viciously attacked, rather than fleeing the land, fleeing the country, which he could do. I wondered if you were thinking of Kutsia and Disgrace when you were writing. I mean, it's hard 
not to, right? It's, it's a book that casts quite a long shadow. Um, and I was aware that a more, in some respects, probably conjured, you know, that female figure at the, at the end of Kutsia's book. I sort of hoped I'd sidestepped it until I gave it um, to a few people to read for their feedback. Um, amongst those people, as you know, was you, and you raised this question. Um, so I, I sort of thought, well, maybe, maybe I haven't escaped quite as neatly as I, as I believed. Um, I, wrestled, I wrestled with that question. But I don't think that that what's being asked of people is the same in both cases. I mean, you're you're somewhat uh, gliding over the matter of the rape in um, yeah. in disgrace because you know, a lot of my feminist friends were outraged by disgrace or at least very very exercised by it. You know, it seems to be the case that, that he's saying this is the price. This is the price of living in the new South Africa, that perhaps you will be violated and that you will simply have to accept that and that, that that is the cost. I don't think that's what's being articulated in my book. At least it's certainly not what I was consciously trying to articulate. Having to give up your bodily integrity is one thing. Having to give up a small piece of land even a small piece of your inheritance is quite another. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that I would prescribe for white South Africans giving up their bodily integrity as a way forward, but I do think it's not perhaps too much to ask that white South Africans give up something of what they have. Um, it seems a more realistic way forward, if, if, if I may say that. Again, not that I was prescribing that as a way forward. It, it, it really is... Um, something that arose out of the terms that my, my own book created. And I'm... I would, told, argue, I would argue that it's a very simplistic reading of, of Kutsia to read that he's advocating that or that his character is advocating that. Um, right. I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd agree and argue the point too, but, but even in broad terms, it seems to me that, um, you know, what, what's being asked of Lucy, I believe her name is, that at, at the end of Disgrace, is, is a different proposition to what Amor has chosen to give up at, at the end of my book. Yeah. Damon, we have to end, and we have to end sharply because of um, load shedding and, and oh. our host <laughs> load shedding. So I'm so sorry we have to end in the very middle of this conversation. I'd love to go on for another hour, but please, everybody, read this book. Um, I love it. Uh, I think I think you've been all through. Uh, and thank you very much for being with us. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. It's passed very quickly. It has. These online launches seem to go by in a blink of, the, in a blink of an eye. <laughs> um, here's a, here's the, the book that we've been talking about so that you can all see what it looks like and, and make sure you go and get yourselves a copy if you haven't yet. Um, thank you very much, Mark and Damon, for a really fascinating conversation. It seems that uh, one small positive of these online book launches we are being forced to have at the moment is that the resulting videos are available for anyone to watch for as long as the internet is around. And it's really wonderful that we'll have this conversation about a future classic in the archive of South African literature online forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much to Penguin Random House for helping us put this launch together. If you haven't got a copy of The Promise yet, as I say, surely this discussion will um, make you want to run out and get one as soon as possible. Um, and who knows, maybe one day you can meet Damon in real life and he'll sign it for you, if you're lucky. Perhaps when this is all over. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for joining us and have a good evening. Thanks to both of you. Bye-bye. <laughs>